No one would blame you for thinking we've reached the cultural end times. Dancing Klingons, paintball baby Yoda, time-traveling Nazis shooting Roman soldiers, Snow White's seven dwarves replaced with seven magical people, and more torturously feeble indulgent horseshit from a Hollywood industry so attracted to the smell of its own farts that the entire civic municipality of Los Angeles is liable to perish in a massive methane explosion. It's actually just shite. The most traditional and popular type of narrative is the hero's journey, an innocent rising from ignorance and naivety into a painful awareness of the world and its evils. Harry Potter at Hogwarts, Dorothy from The Wizard of Oz, Luke Skywalker in Star Wars, Oliver Twist, and Frodo in The Lord of the Rings all fit into this category. Where the hero isn't a warrior, but a vessel of morality and courage, who relies on their friend-making, problem-solving, and moral grit to make it through. In an astonishing cultural turnaround, the top 50 films at the box office over this year and the last have featured virtually no conventional hero journey narratives from youth to a fully idealized self. Avatar The Way of Water? I don't think many people even remember what that film was about, let alone who the characters were. Barbie, Top Gun Maverick's hero, had already been through the hero's journey and was more of a mentor figure. Jurassic World Dominion was just an overbloated load of ass. Ant-Man, Quantumania, Indiana Jones, Thor, Love and Thunder, which was just a bunch of actimates pissing around, Black Adam, Bullet Train, Lightyear, Smile, DC League of Super Pets, Megan, Morbius, and on and on. And that's before we even get to the real psychological cesspool that is streaming on Disney+, Plus, where you have an archetype we see more and more these days in Nick Fury, the opposite of the hero's journey. Over the hill, isolated, disengaged, resistant to change. Passive. So what's the root cause of this? What is the problem with hero's journey storytelling? Unfortunately, it's partly a reflection of the neuroses of modern writers, unable to make a certain journey in their own lives. In the modern age, there are millions of people who haven't gone through an emphatic rite of passage, a transition of separation and individuation into strongly defined adulthood. In other words, while their balls may have literally dropped during puberty, they figuratively still haven't grown a pair. The modern millennial and Gen Z American has far less friends than 20 years ago, lives at home longer, has record low levels of sex, and is more prone to low self-esteem. This is an archetype who hasn't made their own hero's journey rite of passage on the smaller, humbler scale of everyday life. What the psychoanalytic pioneer Carl Jung called the per eternus, a term he revived from ancient myth. This affects young men and women. We'll get to the ladies in a bit, but for now, let's focus on the boys. A per Aeternus is someone marooned in adolescence, unable to face the trials and tribulations of life when they grow up. The per Aeternus can bring the energy and creativity of childhood into adult life, but fights against his inner drive towards becoming a fully realized person. This stunts growth. They often have a rich inner life, but they do not bring it into consciousness. The potential remains hidden and unused. Unable to form satisfactory relationships or carry the weight of responsibility, a poor Aeternus feels that their life has become meaningless. Such people usually have great difficulty in finding a job, or whatever they find is never quite right or quite what they wanted. The woman is never quite the right woman. She's nice as a girlfriend, but there's always some hitch which prevents marriage or any kind of commitment. The poor Aeternus is aware of the transitoriness of life, so he does not give himself wholeheartedly to any experience, because entering into life means entering upon his own mortality and into the corruptible world. The poor Aeternus typically lives a provisional life, harboring a strong attitude and feeling that his job or relationship is not yet what is really wanted. They are mere placeholders until the real thing arrives. In our modern age, such a person is missing a sense of identity, which results in disquieting feelings of fragmentation and worthlessness. Modern characters, especially in Disney's Marvel and Star Wars, are neurotic man-child archetypes, adrift in threatening, distorted, abstracted, and, you guessed it, fragmented realities. Just as the real world appears to unassertive, unrealized poor Aeternus types who have fetched up in Hollywood writing rooms. Think of Loki or Mark Spector in Moon Knight. Look at Kylo Ren, and you see this archetype almost starkly born out. But you also see it in the solitary, guilt-ridden, self-effaced Kenobi, the drifting, unassertive celebrity, more a friend than authoritative parent of Ant-Man. The Avengers saga was such a monumental success because everything was built on and informed by preceding films. 
From phase four onward, everything is atomized and nothing seems to acknowledge or be aware of anything else. Giant celestial robotic gods poking out of the ocean and into the atmosphere, the notion that you could be snapped out of existence at any moment, cat tentacle monsters, anyone possibly a shape-shifting alien, all of this, this uncertain, dark and threatening world. Remember those earlier terms? Provisional, disquieting, are environments brought to life by passive minds. There is a disconnect where regular, more or less well-adjusted people don't want to see this kind of characterization. It's partly why Phase 4 was so lackluster, and why there was a string of bombs earlier in the summer. Films with insipid, unrelatable characters we don't care about and couldn't connect with, from Shazam to The Flash. But we can't attribute all of this mess to the fellas, because the ladies have their own equivalent of the poor Eternus. Puella Eterna women in modern society have their own dynamics and characteristics. There are three distinct types. The counter-dependent, narcissistic character, who are aloof and shun intimacy, known as the eternal girl behind armored glass. The dependent, narcissistic character, who often develops an intense, almost exclusive focus on themselves, known as the eternal darling girl. And the alpha-narcissistic character, known as, you're going to love this, the eternal proud warrior princess, There is an archetype we commonly see expressed on screen, where a hero's journey is swapped out for a character who is already fabulous and brave, and the onus is on the wider world to come to terms with and recognize how stunning that character is, and for the character herself to sweep away any impediments, the negative narratives of society, and allow herself to fully embrace her awesomeness. Gratifying for the writers? Sure. Tedious for the viewer? Absolutely. Some kind of emptiness underneath it all? You bet. Disney's ethos is one of decent family values, but its content is full of characters who are rootless, unable to connect properly with the world, unsettled, unable or not interested in forming relationships, and who are often cast in a shifting setting they can't properly comprehend or integrate with. This wouldn't be the case if Disney's pool of writers didn't include a bunch of lightweight, flaky, unadjusted writers who shy away from writing hero's journey narratives because it touches on something disagreeable, disquieting, and unrealized about their own identities. If studios like Disney do want to reconnect with a more traditional, family-centric audience, then the solution is for them to say to the beta male writers, get lost. Then turn to the female writers, say, look, ladies, we've given you a little go, it hasn't worked out, so we're moving on. And then bring in some cool guys with lots of life experience, have them snort a bunch of blow, and then get them to stay up all night writing stuff people actually want to see. These are practical, sensible, and actionable solutions.